much I've given you a sense of what's at issue so that you can begin to read the, 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 the Lonergan's work. Uh, I mentioned in the introduction that he, he had this hope of producing a textbook which was never realized. Uh, the second volume will come out and you'll see uh, an effort to put together his various attempts. Uh, and I don't think it will measure up to the ambition he had to produce a fundamental text. Uh, the, the, the people doing the other volume, I'm told, are struggling at the wrong time of the idea. I, I can't imagine how they're doing this. Uh, Kerry was telling me, I, and I knew it, that, that they get the problem of doing an index at Christmas time. Well, it just can't be done, so let's hope there's a miracle. Can you briefly relate volume 15 to volume 21? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, volume 15 emerged from uh, Lonergan's return to economics. Uh, in 77, he was in St. Mary's Hall in Boston College, and uh, the notion was he should try and present his economics. So he, he planned to present it in January, and that was the first time he taught it. And uh, what he taught was part three of this book, which was the, the manuscript that was available to most people. The time that, that this is the piece that he. This is the essay in circulation. The essay in circulation has uh, it's it's in five chapters here, uh, and uh, in the index I indicate that this is what I call his Einsteinian version of the analysis, as opposed to part one, which is a much more readable uh, version, written around 1942. Uh, and it's quite marvelous, uh, the, the, the rhythm of English. Uh, my favorite sentence in Lonergan is on page 11. Uh, it's a, an entire paragraph, perhaps, which is worth reading. Uh, it, it's, it's, if you like, it's reading history in terms of this diagram. Uh, and it's, it's really powerfully put. He, he swings through history like a compendium of the table of contents of Toynbee's 12 volumes. Uh, I'll read it just to give you an impression of it. In any stage of human history, from prehistoric caves to the utopias which our prophets describe with such vivid detail, among priv primitive fruit gatherers, among hunters and fishers, in the first dawn of agricultural civilization, along Egypt's Nile and Babylon's Euphrates, under India's mysticism, China's polish, Greek thought, Roman law, through the turmoil of the Dark Age and the ferment of the medieval period, in the European expansion and the modern world, world, everywhere one finds the pulsating flow, the rhythmic series of the economic activities of man. That's quite a sentence. <laughs> and he seems to capture, like say, the, the, the Chinese polish, he captures the, the whole rhythm from the Xi dynasty right through to the Ming dynasty. Uh, but he's, he's at his best at this stage. He has been working since 1929 in his spare summers, uh, struggling with a lot of stuff that isn't in this volume. It might be a third volume. Volume 15 is, sorry, I lost Now, volume 15, uh, when he got back to economics in 78, he began teaching the third part of this with little additions. And uh, then over the next next four years, or five, he, he went over it, he amended it, he tried to modify it to teach it, he tried to link it with contemporary variables uh, like savings and investments and consumption. Uh, and, and in the end, as you probably know from the struggling editors, uh, there's a sort of a, a model of manuscripts. Uh, you'll find in volume 15 a, a magnificent effort of Charles Heffling to put them in a diagram, the bits and pieces he selected out over the years. Eventually, he, he didn't teach the end part of 15 at all. He was 
endlessly trying to go over the, the first two parts. And he didn't have the, the rest of the stuff. Uh, I, I had the second part at this stage, and I picked out a few bits that I thought would be useful. Uh, the second part of this book is very uh, difficult. Uh, my view is that it's not abandoned, but that he found a way of avoiding certain complex second year coursework, which nonetheless is very important in economics. Uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, and I think Joe may have nodded, uh, uh, the, 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 the notion that to find out about the adequate flow of money, it's not a quantity of money. You have to find out about turnover frequencies and things like that. And in the second part, there's an amazing effort to analyze the aggregate turnover frequencies of all businesses. It's, it's a terrific push showing that uh, you can actually meaningfully talk about the relation of a quantity of money to the flows in the economy. But to, to, to do that, uh, and those familiar with the quantity theory of money know that this leaps beyond a, a tradition of stupidity, this quantity theory of money. To, to make sense of it, you have to get an aggregate account of the initial transitional and final payments in all the businesses. And that requires an account of the turnover frequencies in businesses. It's, it, it, there's some terrific stuff here uh, which don't belong in a first year textbook. Uh, so, so he finished part one uh, and he gave that manuscript at some stage to Eric Kearns, a friend of his who was finance minister in the Trudeau government. Uh, Eric buried it in his files. <laughs> and uh, Eric also got the, the third part and he told me in the late 70s that he never had time to read it. <laughs> but he did read the first part because the manuscript I finally got had marks by Eric in it. So uh, when he started teaching then in 78, he had the third part only uh, and very little memory of the rest. Uh, now, so volume 15 is Lonergan trying to work towards a more elementary presentation, and uh, he never got there. But there's some very interesting bits and pieces that are, are more up to date. But I, I, my own opinion is that the definitive analysis is the, the analysis in part three, and you supplement it with pieces of part one. And if you want a sense of what he's at, you do read chapter one. It, it's uh, magnificent English. Uh, he's 38 years old and full of uh, spice and vinegar and that sort of stuff. And he's sort of merciless uh, in dealing with stupidity. He, he talks about the, the uh, titanator being obsolete and that the, uh, our world will be obsolete, you know, because this monster had a 10 ton body and a 10 ounce brain and, and this is where we are going. And he calls for a type of contemplation that would rise above disciplines and envisage the future. And he has some wonderful searchings for a new type of civilization where primitive gardening will be transposed and you have local economies that are efficient. Uh, and that's something that will emerge, I think, in the third world response to the idiocy of the World Bank. Uh, there are movements in Africa, I, I have a footnote here to Brown, Browning's book, Africa's Choice After 30, 30 Years of the World Bank. Uh, and the account of small movements, especially African women, uh, trying against the tide to uh, invent local economies that are successful. So, so volume 15 then is, is his late efforts. Uh, I, I think you have to recognize that, you know, at 75, uh, he, he's tired. 
he's trying to communicate, and uh, those classes were really heavy on him. And in his spare time, I describe it in the preface here, he was actually doing what I call dialectics. He, he had shown Peter's big history, it's about 1,500 pages, and he went over it and over it, trying to sift out what was progress. Uh, and there's some very good stuff there. Now, uh, that may appear in some later volume. Uh, it, it, went, it got into some of his lectures in those four years. But I, I think this is Lonergan uh, at his feistiest between the age of, age of uh, 38 and uh, 36 and 38.